Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And this time, we're going to talk a little bit about an interesting twist on a topic that we've talked about a lot before, and that's theranostics. And this is how um, how external beam radiotherapy, what we can learn from it, and what we can combine that into our uh, theranostics uh, program. And, and, and for that, we had uh, a very interesting talk today by... Uh, uh, Professor Catherine Vallis uh, f- from the UK, from uh, Oxford. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And um, and uh, it was a really interesting talk. And I think what was interesting, it covered a range of different aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's get start. Let's tell us a bit about yourself and your background and where you come from. Sure. So um, I'm a radiation oncologist and um, professor of oncology at Oxford University. Um, as well as a, a clinical practice in oncology, I run a research laboratory which um, is focused on developing new radiopharmaceuticals for imaging uh, but also for therapy. So I, I'm unusual insofar as I have a background in radiation oncology but my research is in nuclear medicine and uh, that really is the, the background to my topic this morning. I don't think your background should be unusual. No. I think it should be where people are going. I think it's important that therapy is front and centre in terms of what we do in nuclear medicine. I, could, I, think, yeah. I think, would you agree with that? I completely agree with that. And, um, you know, one of the discussions we've been having um, at the conference here is, you know, this concept that nuclear oncology should be lined up there with radiation oncology, medical oncology and surgical oncology as a sub specialty in our, our discipline, our specialty. So yes, I, I think nuclear oncology is an important. Right, and, and I think that's increasingly important. It's pretty obvious, for example, it's now really the standard form of treatment in uh, really in your endocrine tumours now. Yes, uh, absolutely. And and I think it's going to be the standard form of treatment in prostate cancer, I think, in many ways. I think there's a, yep. it's, it's rapidly moving in that direction. Yes. I, I think what's interesting is that uh, it's rapidly moving in in the direction of of cancers that that really have been unsuccessful in many ways using conventional treatments, and I think yep. a lot of the work we do is is even more successful because we're targeting things that have been hard to do in the past, yes. and and I think it's uh, it's great that uh, that we're doing that, but I'm not sure that we're doing it right yet. I mean, we've done uh, iodine therapy, uh, radioiodine therapy has been around since the days of Los Alamos. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and we just give, uh, particularly uh, uh, particularly in a lot of countries, they just give a standard dose. Mm. And, and I think um, uh, radiotherapy has always has got more and more precise. You've had a team of physicists who've been painting little uh, <laughs> targets and, and, and drawing things on and lining things up exactly yeah. in thermoplastic masks and everything else Absolutely. to try and make sure that when we do um, uh, external beam radiotherapy um, that we do it right by by getting the maximum tolerable dose without causing too much damage to external tissue. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of our therapy has been aimed at just giving a dose, rather than saying should we target for this person, should we target for the particular tumour. Yeah. But a lot of what we're talking about now is about how we can learn from that. Perhaps you could tell yeah. us a bit more about how, how we can learn from that. What sort of things do you do in in external beam radiotherapy that we could learn from? Well, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is, as you've already mentioned, the whole idea of precise dosimetry. And, and that really is the, the bedrock of, of re- external beam radiotherapy. Um, but in nuclear oncology, um, I think that there has been less emphasis on that, or at least on personalized dosimetry. Right. I mean, obviously, this is a big topic of conversation in the field at the moment. Um, but compared to external beam radiotherapy, I think um, the nuclear oncology um, treatments have lagged a bit behind in that way. And then I think the other difference is that um, in radiation oncology, there is now um, a, a vast tradition of combining radiation right. um, with systemic treatments. And, and, and many diseases, um, uh, malignancies are treated with combined therapy regimens. Uh, and again, that is a difference because I think a lot of nuclear medicine treatments um, are given as standalone, right. um, often in um, 
end stage scenarios. Right, so when the other treatments have failed, then you do the nuclear yeah. rather than saying this is the first line treatment Absolutely. combination. Ab- absolutely. Um, so, so our interest is in beginning to develop systems for, com- for combining dose from, from both external beam radiation and from targeted radionuclide therapy, and that's what I was talking about today. Um, it, it's going to be a very complex challenge, um, mainly because the radiobiological effects of um, uh, external beam radiotherapy, which is given in very um, high dose rates, um, are very different to those of uh, targeted radionuclide therapy, where dose is um, absorbed uh, over a long period of time. So, so understanding the differences in the radiobiological effects and taking those differences into account when we try to combine these two treatments is terribly important. And I think we're only really just beginning to get to grips with that. Right. So, I mean, I think it's. I think there's there's kind of almost two aspects to that. One yes. is, one is um, the radiation effects, uh, almost like radiotherapy gives it too intensely, uh, nuclear medicine gives it too slowly. Yeah. Something in the middle is probably more appropriate. Yeah. You want to do, um, and but the other effect is just the mm, uh, the geometrics. Yes. So you've got you've got a large bulk tumor that maybe the trace is not going to get into the middle of. Whereas a radiotherapy, exactly. you've got a single cell. You're not going to target radiotherapy on a single cell, but yeah. a, 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 a new radionuclide can target that single cell. Maybe Maybe exactly. effectively. So that's the combination you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. So um, this is a concept, again, which we're familiar with in, in mainstream oncology, combining a local treatment, radiation oncology, with a systemic treatment. Um, and this is called spatial cooperation. Um, and and you, you've described it perfectly correctly, that if we can um, debulk um, a primary tumour, which is usually the largest um, volume of tumour, um, and then use a systemic treatment to deal with either occult or or frank metastases. And so um, I, I think this is the, the way forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it makes a lot of sense too because it means that um, there's difficulties in logistics around around radiotherapy and there's difficulties in logistics around uh, around uh, radioisotope therapy yes. in terms of supply. Maybe you can help help alleviate both concerns by, by maximising the effectiveness of both. Yes, that's true. I mean, I suppose ideally what we will find is that by combining both we can escalate dose to tumour because now we're combining dose from two different sources, if you like. Um, without necessarily increasing the risk of toxicity to normal tissues. Right. And um, we think that that may be the case because um, the normal tissues at risk are different for the two types of treatment. Right. Um, so, that, so that's uh, a potential advantage of, of combining right. the two. And I guess we really working closer to actually maybe looking at cures for treatments or rather than uh, or at least longer emission periods for these hard to treat cancers in in that respect yeah i I think so i think there are many um, indications where this combined approach could be very helpful um you know we've we've done some work ourselves on in the context of a selective internal radiation therapy for hepatic uh, tumours and um, the possibility of combining that treatment with external beam radiotherapy. I think there was two aspects that you touched mm. on. One was was using, because the uh, Theranostics often use the diagnostic, which is the same as therapeutic uh, t- uh, target, uh, yeah. uh, either a different, a different, uh, the, the same uh, molecule, for example, copper sixty, copper sixty four, and copper sixty seven, and sure. so on. But uh, but. But what we can do with that, we can measure the effectiveness of the of the radioisotope and figure out where it hasn't been effective, and maybe then we can retarget with radiotherapy. Exactly. And, exactly. And that would that would enhance the effectiveness of them. So that you know, the concept is that you could give cert, and as long as you had accurate dose symmetry, um, you could define those areas of um, metastases that were underdosed yes. with the cert, and potentially top the dose up with stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, for example, a very precise um, 
hyperfractionated uh, way of giving radiation therapy. Um, so I think that's perfectly plausible. It, it's going to take some work and research no. to figure out exactly how to do it safely. But, but that's just one example. I think there will be others. Well, I think you gave another example, yeah. which was, was that by increasing the permeability of lesions by giving uh, external beam radiotherapy, you can, yeah. you can make the radioactive material more effective by getting into tumours. Would that be? Yeah. So, so that's um, another potential mechanism, if you like, for a collaborative um, effect of the two treatments. And we know that um, external beam radiotherapy has an effect on blood vessels. It tends to um, cause them to become more permeable, at least briefly after the um, radiation is given. And it's possible that if we timed administration of a radionuclide therapy properly with the radiation, external beam radiation, that we might see increased uptake accumulation of the radionuclide in tumour because of that effect. So that's something that we've observed in some preclinical um, uh, small animal um, work that we've done. And um, yes, I think that's, that's a potentially exploitable interaction between the two treatments. I think there's a lot of work ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it's going to involve a lot of people doing a lot of research and, lot, and it's going to involve measurement. Yeah. It's going to be involved lots of measurement. No doubt about it. Yeah. How can people find out a bit more about this? About the... Um, about these different research projects, about yeah. how they can participate, about how they can get involved. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I think at the moment, um, y you know, it, there's a lot of work to do in the preclinical area. What we, we don't know at the moment is, is how to schedule these two treatments together. Yes. As I say, we, we've got to understand much more the radiobiological effects of the radionuclide therapies so that we can incorporate that information into combined um, treatment uh, dose maps. Um, so that's, that's pretty investigational at the moment. That's, right. that's really being done mainly in the preclinical yep. arena. Um, but I think, I think people are beginning to think about developing clinical protocols. And we talked about one in the session today um, uh, where um, there is a plan to combine um, radio labeled PSMA uh, with external beam radiotherapy in prostate cancer. Um, and so I, I think these clinical protocols, you know, prospective studies, rational studies combining the two treatments are going to start emerging over the next um, few months to years. And, you know, we'd encourage people to participate in, in that work and those clinical trials. Excellent. Yeah. All right. That's, yeah. that's amazing stuff. And I think, yeah. I, look, I'd encourage people who are interested in this to get on board and just, just do it. And yeah. I, think, I think a lot of these, some of these are not huge trials. Some of them are small ones. Right. Um, they can be doable, I think, yeah. if people apply to the right places and yeah. get, get the right grants or get commercial funding. For example, the one talked about today yes. was, was, was uh, largely uh, commercial funded, but that yes. was in, in Western Australia. So, so I think, you know, there's lots of work that can be done along this area. And yeah. I really appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you Thank very you. much. Pleasure. Thank you. Good.